<sighs> haven't done one of these in quite a while. Gotta say, I like the fact that my ugly mug is getting better in each webcam video. But anyway, what's up, guys? Um, I haven't done really a vlog in a little while. Um, quite frankly, I think that's what I'm just going to devote this YouTube channel to now. Every once in a while I'll do a side project, but I think I've now just determined with YouTube in general that I'm just going to keep track of all my side projects outside of YouTube and stuff and make this more like a vlog channel than, say, a channel where I do segments. Like I said in the last update, guys, I'm not going to give up on Lesser Known but Awesome Heroes and many other, many other side projects that I've kind of put on the back burner. I finally just made the decision creatively that I'm going to focus more on my writing and stuff for 2K14, Meridian Park, and all that. So what I'm going to end up doing, guys, is I'm just going to simply make this more a vlog-esque channel. So the most that you'll probably see like from this channel from now on is more vlogs. But the cool part is that it's not just going to be update vids. I'm going to actually just like, you know, today I'm actually going to talk about or rather tonight, since it's like technically almost 7.30 at the time of, you know, this webcam recording. Um, that, I'm going to talk about a couple of things that have been happening in pop culture and give my thoughts on a couple of books that I recently read and my own opinion on a couple of things and whatnot, what have you. And I'm trying to get to where I'm not glaring on the computer screen but I also want to look straight ahead at you guys because I got my head, you can't tell, but I'm tilting my head down here so my glasses don't catch glare. Um, but, yeah, see, I can't stare straight into the webcam. And I'm pretty sure you guys don't want to see a glare of me looking at myself within myself. A little creepy. But anyway, the announcement has been made that Paul Rudd is actually going to be playing Ant-Man. Um, and a couple of people have asked me, you know, well, how do you feel about that? Well, I've seen very few things with Paul Rudd. And to be honest, I'm indifferent. But looking at the guy and looking at his track record as far as comedies, guys, somebody made the notion that we may not get Scott Lang, we may not get, like, Hank Pym, or, like, rather, Pym will be set up in the first part of the movie. Which I'm fine, because that's what Edgar Wright wanted to do in the beginning. Um, and some people are saying, well, maybe we won't get Scott Lang, but rather maybe we'll get Eric O'Grady, the irredeemable Ant-Man. And a lot of people aren't happy by the theory of that, but to me, I'm fully accepting of that theory. Eric O'Grady's not my favorite Ant-Man. He's my least favorite, but for those of you who have been following the 2K14 website, I am at least using him on the, on the Astonishing Avengers roster and doing quite well. I love... I love what I'm doing with Eric. He's, he, despite the fact that he's not my favorite version of Ant-Man, I still am willing to read stuff with him, and I'm still willing to read a couple of issues of Irredeemable Ant-Man and stuff just for, like, character reference. And because, you know, there is, I just like anybody else, there's something charming about Eric O'Grady in a very, shall we say, scandalous kind of way. I mean, this is a character who's using his Ant-Man abilities, his Pym Particle abilities to spy on female superheroes in the shower. This is a guy who's not really, you know, a superhero archetype. He's very much anti-hero. This is a guy who, if given the opportunity, would take cash out of a register as he's trying to stop a burglar. That's the kind of character Eric O'Grady is. And I don't mind if, if Paul Rudd is actually cast to play O'Grady because... You know, Paul Rudd, I think, could do decent as O'Grady because, from what I, because like I said, from what little I have seen of Rudd, I think he'd be perfect as Eric O'Grady. <clears throat> I think it'd be pretty perfect casting to me. I'm not, I'm not against it. Um, as far as okay, we're gonna get the Wasp in here. Um, the actress to play Jan. Haven't seen anything with her in it, so I can't comment, but I think it is kind of cool that Jan's going to make her cinematic debut. And even if 
like I said, it is the Eric O'Grady Ant-Man. I'm perfectly content with them finding a way to bring in Wasp, as long as they don't explain that these two have a relationship or a fling or something like that. Um, but, you know, whichever. Um, and the couple of other news is the fact as the actress playing Wonder Woman, I'm going to skip over that because I have no opinion on that. I'll see it when I believe it. Same thing with them saying that the, that the Flash is going to show up in Superman vs. Batman. Um, but also, getting away from pop culture, I'm going to go on an aside here. I've been seeing a lot of videos as of late, because I check a lot of autism you know, support groups. You know, Me being somebody who is an Aspie, you know, somebody with Asperger's Syndrome, and somebody being on the autism spectrum, I've been seeing a lot of videos as of late that I find very reprehensible. I just got done watching a YouTube video on this family talking about how, oh, if you didn't document this and, you know, the mother wishing that, you know, she could cure autism. And these are the kinds of parents that really irritate me because, okay, I get that having a child, especially on the low end of the spectrum, is a very bad thing. I wouldn't wish it on any parent. It's kind of, it just happens. But I also don't like nor appreciate that the media, as I've stated probably in a couple of previous vlogs, but I don't like the media always like dams autism, saying that, you know, trying to make it seem like it's an epidemic, like a virus, or that it's, you know, this terrible curse, almost like, you know, fictional, like, lichenism, like werewolfism. And I look at that. And I kind of have to feel sad for the people that are ignorant and misinformed, but there's also a part of me that busts out laughing at that. Because they over-dramatize and completely blow it so over the top that it leaves me actually scratching my head like, these are supposed to be, like, not only journalists, these are supposed to be people who are supposed to go out and report this stuff. And the same thing could be said for the scientists. These are people who are researchers. These are people with bachelor degrees from community colleges to Ivy League colleges. And yet they don't have the single clue that autism in and of itself, while it is classified in some psychological circles as a neurological disorder, it's not really bad. Take it from a guy who, you know, <coughs> oh, excuse me, take it from a guy who next month will be 26 years old and has lived on the upper part of the spectrum. To me, it, there's no diameter. Upper, lower, it doesn't really matter that much. Lower, it's just, you know, people struggle a little bit more. But my personal opinion, autism is not as bad as people think it is. Especially, okay, the higher end scale, it's not really that bad, but, you know, there's a couple of quirks that go with it and some trouble stuff for parents, but the lower end, I can understand, maybe the one that they focus on the most. Because it is, you know, and the sad part is, is that people that are like that, people on the spectrum, don't really get the help that they need. In fact, they're kind of outcasted. I mean, let's face it. For many years, people who had Asperger's and were autistic and stuff, they were claimed to be of mental illness and put in asylums rather than being helped. So that should tell you something about our society. You know, that it was back during a time when medicine wasn't as advanced as it was now. And i got to be honest, I get tired of seeing on the news how they say, oh, well, we're coming up with a cure. Why vaccinate something that there's not that really is not curable? It's genetics. And plus, if anything, if you try to tamper with somebody's genetics to make them not autistic, then in a sense, it'd be no different than taking, say, somebody who's black's you know skin color away from them. You're basically taking away the individuality of what makes that person who they are. And I've always said this, it feels like X-Men The Last Stand in real life. Like, I feel like literally I'm on the mutant side of this spectrum, and then you got everybody else who's 
either autistic on the spectrum or whatever and they're like I want to be cured or I hate being me and you know I realize that everybody has a tough life I realize everybody has to go through the difficulties that they do but you're full of crap if you think that being cured is going to actually help you because it's not that's life in life we each have our own struggles <clears throat> excuse me and the sad part is is that life only gets harder as you get older you become old, you become decrepit, you tend to rely more on people as you get older. You know, it's not me being cold, it's not me being arrogant or ignorant, it's just simple truth. I see it every day. I see elderly people that don't get the help that they need or people walk by them because they're because in their eyes they're old and decrepit. Now, is that me making a generalized statement? Yeah, it's a little ignorant on my part, I won't deny it. It's a little ignorant to pretty much put a label on everybody in society but I put that label for a reason because we as a society especially and I've noticed it you know during this month which is supposed to be Christmas Christmas is the Christmas the way that I grew up was a season of giving once a month you tried to not do any of the crap that you do the rest of the year you know, you try to be a much more selfless and noble person. Instead, it's been quite the opposite this year and the last couple of years and probably into the future it'll get worse. I'm hearing stories, especially from Black Friday, the ripple effect of shootings, stabbings, people getting mugged, people, ha people having their homes vandalized. It seems now that anarchy is starting to reign in our society where now, even the most sacred of holidays, and I use air quotes here, because Christmas is supposed to be a sacred holiday, and it doesn't feel that way anymore. I've had tons of people being rude and being belligerent because they're in a hurry. they got to get their shopping list done. And it was interesting because I, had, I overheard a conversation with one of my coworkers talking about how it's, and especially an elderly, and especially an elderly man who's who I was helping, you know, help load his car because he needed help. And it was very interesting to me the fact that they were all, that they brought up the same common theme, and I didn't think about it until it actually made sense. It you know the epiphany of it kind of hit me, and it's kind of true. Christmas has become more commercialized, and it's more about. Oh yeah, buying somebody a laptop, buying somebody an Xbox, buying somebody an iPod. And at first I thought, well, you know, they're kind of gifts. But then when I thought about the reality of it, and especially how expensive a lot of electronics are nowadays, it made sense. Christmas necessarily is not about giving a gift just to have a gift. But it's more about Christmas is about getting a gift for something that you want but you but you want somebody else to buy so you don't have to spend the money that's what Christmas has kind of become now and maybe it's a it's a delusional statement to make but if you guys really stop and think about that there kinda of is some truth to that and the sad part is is that that's what Christmas has become it's like you know Christmas isn't so much about Buy, you know, getting what you really want, wanting people to buy what you're hoping that you could get that's not electronic. It's like for me, I've, I've, I've said this. I, I've always said this, especially to my mother in the last couple of years. For me, I don't want really anything because it's like I, I don't mind gift cards because I will use gift cards. Amazon gift cards. I can always... You know, shop on. I shop on Amazon quite a lot, guys. So it's like Amazon gift cards. I have no problem with, or cards for a Kindle. I've started. You know, I I have a Kindle Fire to which I have actually have started using the comic book app on. You know, I've started started actually using my Kindle a lot more to save on book space because I've got way too many comics. You know, I'm running out of storage room. I feel like I'm one of those people on that episode of Hoarders just with like comic books. And plus, you know, it's like using my Kindle to actually save on book space, guys, is, you know, a very great thing. Because then, 
I have a whole library inside a digital little tab tablet. And you're saying, well, that's technically an, electron an electronical deal, Steve. Yes, it is. It is an electronical deal, but it's an electronical deal that I didn't quite necessarily want, but that I actually found out was something that I could enjoy. And that's really what gifts are at Christmas, and that's really what gifts, like, and, you know, it, it, it's one of those deals to where when you're younger, you always groan at how Grandma knitted you a sweater, but as you get older, you start to appreciate that because the time and effort that was put into, and the heart and soul put into that is what makes you appreciate it. You know, that that's, I think, the, the age differentiation at, at Christmas, too, is that you know, kids want the latest thing. They want something that isn't lame, like a sweater or something. But when you get older, you start to actually appreciate those. And I think that's the sad part about Christmas, is that a lot of people have lost touch and lost base with what Christmas really was about. Um, for people who are overly religious, it was about, you know, the birth of Jesus or the death of Jesus. Um, for people who are Jewish, it's about Hanukkah, which they actually celebrated early this year. Um, you know, it's, you know, Kwanzaa, New Year's, you know, but Christmas, Christmas is always, I was always taught that Christmas was the season for giving. And that's, and I try to be a giving person throughout the year, you know, Christmas or not. You know, that, that, that's just the way I prefer to be. But I've, taken half the time now here to just like ramble on about you know the true meaning of Christmas and how I still feel offended by the way the media portrays autism so back to the pop culture stuff I talked about talked about Paul Rudd being Ant-Man um, mentioned the deal with you know Wonder Woman and Flash being in the Superman versus Batman movie the world's finest movie um, so I'm going to actually talk about a couple of other things off the top of my head, if I can remember them. Oh yeah, I recently, guys, actually sat down and rewatched Iron Man 3. I also sat down and rewatched Man of Steel. And the funny part is, people still complain about Man of Steel. And as somebody who has been a, a fan of the Big Blue for many years, always enjoyed, you know, the the Boy Scoutness of Superman, I still like Man of Steel. Not because it's a fresh take, but I like Man of Steel because it's an honest take on Superman. And let me explain what I mean by honest. We all know fantastically Superman's origins. But let's be honest. Superman in the comics was never really that special. He was just a baby from an alien world who, that exploded and died, and he came to Earth, and there was like a Jesus to Moses motif to the character when he first was created. Now, you take what Zack Snyder and Christopher Nolan did in Man of Steel, which is the fact that he's not only the last Kryptonian, but he's the first in millions upon centuries of years, the first natural birth on Krypton. And that further extenuates the character. That furthermore may actually makes him special. Not relatable, but special. And then you add in the fact that Paul Kent didn't die from a heart attack, but he died heroically by being, you know, taken out by a tornado. Which, to me, as somebody who has read the comics for many years, I like that better. Because it extenuates the point for Clark as a character to develop that his heroism and strength came from the fact that his father nobly sacrificed himself. And a lot of people will say, well, that's kind of a weak interpretation, Steve. I, I'll admit, it's not perfect. But when you think about it in the, you know, in the long run for how it will impact the character if it becomes a film franchise, it actually works very well. <clears throat> and it also kind of adds a little bit of a relatable quality to Clark because he had the power to save everyone. And yet the fact that he had to remain hidden will always haunt him for the rest of his days. And I'll talk about the big one. You know, Zod's death. 
this is the focal point of Man of Steel that everybody always complains about and whines about. The fact that, well, why did he have to do this? He could, and I always hear the same excuses. Oh, he could have flew him out of there. He could have done this. He could have done that. Let me just pop the bubble here for everybody who keeps putting these theories out here. Number one, there's no Phantom Zone in this movie franchise. There's no extra dimensional portal that Clark could have thrown Zod in. Number two, this isn't, and it's even what F.W. Waller and many other people have pointed out, this is not the Superman that we know. Clark is inexperienced. <clears throat> Clark is inexperienced. He's never faced anybody on his same level. That's one thing that the movie really drove home, was the fact that Clark, for two days, two days, was Superman. He was, practically, he was still Clark Kent, just in the suit. So, he had no fighting experience. He's going up against people that are just as strong, if not better than him, because they've had years of training and could easily beat the crap out of him. And plus, he's facing an egomaniac, a very driven egomaniac in Zod. Although I do agree with the joke that Chris the Mount Vernon kid made, the fact that it seemed like the family was getting closer to Zod's, you know, heat vision... But the reality of it is, no matter what Clark did, it still kind of would have ended the same. And a lot of you, I'm sure, can call BS on that, and I'm fine. You know, I can agree to disagree with that. But I also say, what followed afterwards, when Zod's neck was broken, the fact that Clark fell to his knees and cried, if that scene was not in there, I would have said, okay, that's... That's not right. That's not cool. That's not who Superman is. But considering that Clark was grieving, the fact that he just actually killed the last of his race, basically, to save all of Earth, that right there, guys, is major character development. Because then this will lead to Clark having the, I gotta find another way, I don't want to be a killer mentality. It's like, regardless if in the comics he's never killed, I can accept Clark killing in this movie simply because it will develop his character, and it will make him adapt to the no-killing rule, and it will make him a stronger person in the fact that his resolve to want to try to find another way, you know, is going to be strengthened. So, I look at, so while it was a very big negative step towards the character himself, you also got to look in the long run at the logistics of what it may open up to for Clark's character in future Man of Steel movies. So, and also the fact that Clark has now become the savior of Earth, and that's something that I really want to see in later Man of Steel movies, is Clark dealing with the mentality of, okay, I'm now in the open. The world now knows who I am. How do I deal with that? That's what I want to actually see in a sequel to Man of Steel. I want to see how does Clark deal with this? You know, and what should he do? And practically, since, okay, technically, Jorel died again, you know, Clark's going to have no guidance other than Diane Lane, you know, his mother, Ma Ken. So. And other than Lois as well, so it's like, okay, we now, guys, have a focal point for Clark as a character. He now has to find his own way now. And you know what? I'm looking forward to seeing the sequel to Man of Steel. I'm just talking about Superman versus Batman. I'm talking about just another solo Superman movie. Because I think that this did a great job of showing us a different side of Clark that maybe we've never seen before. And I love Mark Wade. I love him to death, but I don't agree with Mark Wade acting like a man child about about this film, nor anybody else, especially in the comic book industry, because I think that that's not. I'm not going to say it's unprofessional. I want to, but it's not really unprofessional. It's just plain childish. We all grew up with different iterations of Superman. My iteration was the Doomsday arc in the 90s. 
the death of Superman. But Superman, to me, has always been a very beloved character. And as somebody who is very faithful to the Big Blue as a character, as somebody who I look at as a quote-unquote Big Brother figure, I could accept this version. Because it actually made me think that, you know, there's a lot of stuff that Snyder and Nolan were really bringing up that, as somebody, as a Superman fan, that I never really actually considered or thought about, and that actually worked a lot better than even the actual comics, dare I say. So, and Iron Man 3, upon another viewing, it's still not the best, it's still the weakest in the trilogy, but I can see a lot of the holes that a lot of my other fellow YouTubers, core members, kind of poke into the thing. Poke into the thing. Like the whole deal that one of our, like, one of my fellow YouTubers core members, the great Southern Treadkill, um, he brought up the point of, you know, how could Tony not just take out the arc reactor and have all that stuff removed? And, you know, that's a good, valid point. But at the same time, I look at it as a next step for the character. And a lot of people say, well, this is the end of Iron Man. And I always said, if it was, somebody else could probably take over. It won't be the same, but somebody could. Um, so I'm indifferent about Iron Man 3. I don't enjoy it. I think it is the weakest, but I also don't think it was the worst. It had some touches of Iron Man 1. It didn't feel like 2, where it was just like a rushed Avengers setup movie. But what I do... But a movie that I did recently watch and I did enjoy was The Wolverine. Ten times better than Origins was. I was very let down by Origins. The Wolverine, though, I smiled because this was the closest thing that we could get to Claremont and Miller's samurai arc in the actual Wolverine comics. And I, and I loved it. And a lot of people said, well, they took too many liberties with the movie. Honestly... And I love what, you know, Ziploc Gory said on his Facebook not a couple of minutes ago. And you know what? It made a lot of sense, actually. Vic was right on point on this, guys. And it's, and basically to interpret and summarize what Vic said, he basically was talking with a lot of people complaining about the second Hobbit movie, which I'll get to in a moment as well, because I saw that as well. Um, the fact that fans are not really happy because they want everything to be pinpoint accurate with adaptations. And I can actually agree with that because, you know, it does seem like as fans we do want the mo we do want the source material to be deeply honored, but sometimes the deviations are kind of a little bit better or make much more sense than even the source material. Now that's not to say that every, you know, movie that has taken liberties has been, you know, necessarily bad. You know, most of them tend to do pretty well. To me, I will admit, I've never read the books on The Hobbit. I, I have actually skimmed through them. I've read, you know, a couple of pages here and there. Um, never really fully read through the books to get myself invested, but I did it more to see, okay, what could be different from the movie than what's in the actual book. And to me, I like the movies in the Lord of the Rings franchise a little more than the books, but then again, I'm not going to completely base that on the fact that, well, oh, I've read the books and I like the movies better. It's more like, okay, I've seen the movies, I gave the books a chance, and it's like, I just prefer the movies. You know, it's just simply state of opinion is all it really is. And in my personal opinion, I've read the Samurai arc, love it, one of my favorite Wolverine arcs. I think that it's a great arc that really shows that Wolverine is not really a savage man, that he is a very conflicted man, given his animalistic nature, and I think Claremont and Miller did a great job of showing that. But I think what I enjoy just as well with that, guys, is the fact that, yeah, a lot of liberties were taken, but the true, but even Chris Claremont himself admitted that he endorses the movie because they took the story and they kept the basic essence. And that's the word that I want to give out to everybody who's watched these movies and they want them to be pinpoint perfect adaptations. Don't look at the movie for how many liberties it takes, but look at it from the perspective of, okay, 
are they keeping true to the essence of what made that source material great? Are they keeping true to the essence of the character? And in all honesty, while Madame Hydra or Viper was an actual mutant, which I found really eerie and creepy, and more than a little like what the hellish, but and I'll admit the the Silver Samurai being a giant mech robot, still kind of I'm like I I couldn't dig that, but the essence of the fact that this story was about Logan finding himself again, that path to redemption, if you will, after what happened in Last Stand, I actually enjoyed. I enjoyed the scenes with Famke Jensen as Gene and telling Logan, you know, you can give up now, you know, we can be together, and Logan saying, you know, I love you, Gene, I'll always love you, and the fact that Logan said, you know, I can't be with you. I finally, you know, made peace with myself for what happened at the end of Last Stand, and I made peace with the fact that this is who I am. This is who I have to be. And that's very, and, you know, you, and it sounds so cheesy, but when you think about it in the context of who Wolverine at, is as a character, that's very powerful. Because this is a guy, a lot of people think that Wolverine's just a thug with claws, you know, he's like, ah, you know, animalistic, but really... If you go beyond the animalistic berserker rage, if you go beyond the claws, if you go beyond Logan having a lone wolf attitude, you really see that there's a lot of complex layers to Logan as a character that can easily, in film, not be explored yet. And so I'm hoping that they'll actually do a third Wolverine movie, and I'm hoping in the X-Men movies that they'll also touch a little more on stuff with Wolverine. But I agree with everybody else. I think that we need another X-Men movie without, you know, Wolverine. Because I actually enjoyed First Class. Even if Wolverine made a cameo, I think the X-Men, to me, has always been a franchise that stands on its feet without Wolverine. Despite him being one of the more popular characters. Um, and even though the X-Men movies don't follow their own continuity, which I can agree with people. I've, you know, thinking back on it. They don't really follow their own continuity, and they tend to shoehorn a lot of mutants. That's why I'm kind of a little worried about Days of Future's Past, because I'm like, this is a big story. This is like Age of Apocalypse big. And then Brian Singer announced, speaking of Apocalypse, he's saying that, yeah, by 2016, we're going to have an Apocalypse movie. That blew my mind, because... You know, like everybody else, the internet just exploded. Well, more so Facebook between all of us nerds and my nerdy friends and cohorts and whatnot on on YouTube and Facebook and whatnot. You know, our heads all exploded and then reformed, and it was just like for the first. It's like it, it dumbfounded me. It's like the first. Mutant. You know, in Sabanor will eventually get his big screen treatment. That, to me, is mind blowing. And finally, we get to see the character on the big screen. And I'm really hoping that if Apocalypse is on there, maybe Mr. Sinister won't be too far, too far away. I'm trying to contain my excitement, but inside right now, my, my inner child is doing, you know, backflips and cartwheels and all kinds of stuff. Um, but I also want to talk about Age of Ultron, because... Somebody, because I finally figured that I would give my thoughts on how do I feel about the fact that in Age of Ultron, we more than likely will have Tony Stark building Ultron. Honestly, I think it's appropriate. Do I want Hank Pym to be the one to build him like the comics? Absolutely. But can I compromise with Tony Stark being the one to build Ultron? Absolutely, because I think what people are forgetting is that Tony's a very smart guy. 
So if Tony's the one that creates Ultron in the cinematic universe, I'm fine with it because it's a good replacement. It's like Tony's a very big genius that he can come up with creating a battle drone that could eventually become Ultron. So I don't see what, why people complain about that. I think that there's a good story there, especially the story idea that they have where Jarvis may be uploaded to Ultron and become corrupted and that that's our version of Ultron. And it makes for a great personal piece for Tony as well. You know, he has to fight his best friend. He has to fight the, you know, his companion, his greatest ally. It's like that... Think about the emotional toll that that will put on us as an audience. Because we've seen Jarvis for like three Iron Man movies. We've seen him for Avengers. And so then the character becomes evil. It's like, it, I think that there's a great potential for storytelling there. Um, and I see that the time is going past a half an hour or so. So I'm going to wrap this up, especially for those of you who don't usually get a lot of time to yourselves. I'm going to also wrap this up too because I'm kind of starting to run out of steam. Um, so I'm going to save the best for last, at least for this version of an update and this vlog. Um, the fact that... Talk about my writing. Um, 2K14, guys, is going to be on hiatus, of course, for you know Christmas and whatnot. We should be resuming writing next Wednesday. I, however, am on a total hiatus um, that will be towards the end of January. I think towards the end of January I'll start picking back up on writing and stuff. And this is for Meridian Park and 2K14, both. Um, and even if I do get any writing done, guys, I'm just going to hold on to it till you know the end of January or so. Um, I just needed a break, you know, I was getting burnt out on writing overall, so I'm like minimizing any writing that I do and just more like kicking back and relaxing, giving myself time to to mentally breathe. Um, not that, you know, and it's not that I'm getting bored with writing, it's just the classic case, guys, of I've done it for, I guess you could say, such extreme amounts of time that I just feel like it's time for a break and I think that's also a wise decision as well I mean if I was getting paid for it maybe I could understand you know like the crunch time and the headaches and the stuff like that but concerned that a lot of this is nonprofit with Meridian Park and Marvel 2k14 concerned that they're nonprofit and they're like both fan fiction sites um, there's no need for me to burn myself out and I feel like I've basically burnt myself out that I've just boosh. Does that mean that I'm going to stop writing at all, period? No. It just means that I'm going to take a break, you know, dabble here and there, write a few things here, write a few things there, etc., etc. Um, but keeping a very minimal role. Um, so the rest of this still, those of you who follow the site, I won't be writing any stories or at least submitting them until the end of January or so once I come back. Um, but I will try to get some stuff between both sites done ahead of time, if I can remember, but I'm not going to rush myself. I got, you know, I, I stick to my word that I'll wait till the end of January and then start worrying about rushing, rushing stuff out or having some stuff prepared. Yeah, I, sometimes, guys, you just need to do that. And well, it's funny because most authors will tell you, write a little bit of something each day, but what they won't tell you is that sometimes you just need to take a break, even if it's going to cost you a little bit of finances and a little bit of time. Because I've always been of the firm belief that you should always try to take a break. Always. Whether you're getting paid for writing or not, mentally killing yourself is not going to work. Because then the quality of your work is going to suffer and the quantity of stories that you can tell is going to get diminished very quickly because you burnt yourself out. And that's what I've done to myself, guys. I've burnt myself out because I'm working on multiple titles. I'm burning myself out. I'm 
I mean, probably if I had to guesstimate, between Meridian Park and Marvel 2K14 alone, I probably got at least 12 or 13 titles and all of them different characters. They're all different characters, guys. I mean, I'm working on Avengers, I'm working on Daredevil, I'm working on Valkyrie, I'm working on Namor, I have the Mystic Defenders, I have X-Factor, I have Zeta Squadron. Um, you know, I got multiverse tiles, I'm working on Iron Fist Noir, I'm potentially going to work on, you know, 1210, the Medieval Marvel Universe titles. So I'm going to have a rotating stock of titles, not just for 2K14, but then... You go to Meridian Park, it's like, I've got Gemini Centaurian, I've got Demon Walker, I've got Daimajin, I've got, you know, I've got Sonic Boom. Occasionally, I rotate with, you know, Tony, Serpentine 451, you know, I do, you know, Broderick's Finest. I do Meridian Team-Ups, which, that's more a title for everybody. You know, I do, of course, you know, Marvel Team-Ups on 2K14, I forgot to mention that one. So... And the potential that I'm also running New Earth. I'm running New Earth 2.0, guys. So I'm also running a website on top of all of these stories. And I'm sure most of you are like, good God, no wonder you need a break. But you know what, though, guys? I look at it this way. With 2K14, there's no real rush. I can make the progress. With Meridian Park, it's a little more urgent. Um, and that's where I think it kind of comes into play, especially with Meridian Park. It's like doing it weekly, I have no problem with it, but it's like I told Tony, it's like it started to feel more like a chore than really something fun. And the basic belief, rule of thumb, that any one of us, especially in the YouTubers core who do a lot of writing, it's just basic rule of writing, period. If it stops becoming fun, maybe it's time to just take a breather, take a break. And honestly, everybody on 2K14 has been very supportive. And, you know, all of them, even Chris himself, even Chris and Tony have both admitted that, you know, yeah, it, maybe it's just time for some of us to, like, you know, take a break overall and maybe focus on, on other stuff. So with that, guys, I'm going to turn this off now. Um, but that's about all the updates. That's about all that I really care to talk about. Um, and so with that, I'm going to just dabble around. May write a couple of things. May do outlines. Haven't decided yet. I'll do whatever I feel like doing. And I will see you guys, I guess, the next time that I feel in the mood to do a vlog. So see you whenever.